Welcome back to another lecture of Aero 4540. So if you remember last time, I did kind of a brief review of what you had already learned in Aero 3240. And in particular, we looked at rotation matrices and their two main uses. And also we had looked at principal rotations as building blocks to uh, create rotation matrices that would represent the orientation of a reference frame with respect to another one through the process of stacking three of those back to back according to a given sequence given to you. And we had learned that the sequence in terms of physical rotation order happens to be the opposite to the order with which you need to multiply the individual principal rotations to then uh, calculate the overall rotation matrix. Now today, the thing I wanna discuss about is a concept of attitude representations, which is a new concept to you. So attitude representations are just different tools or methodologies through which we can answer the following question, which is, what is the current orientation of reference frame B with respect to reference frame A? Well, obviously, you know one of those ways to answer that question, and that is to give me the rotation matrix, CBA, for example. But as we'll discover through this section, there are other uh, ways to answer that particular question, one of which is through the Euler angles. Another way is the use of axis angle attitude representation. And the last one we'll have a look at is a concept of quaternions, which is the most commonly used attitude representation in the industry. Okay, so let's do that in 1.3. Attitude representations. Or again, how to answer the question, what is the current or the actual orientation of a reference frame? With respect to another one. All right, so what seems like a very trivial question, we're going to discover that there are a couple of ways that we can answer that particular question. Okay, so the first way to answer that question is through the use of, just, just hold on a second, okay, I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back, sorry about that. There was some background noise that I needed to, uh, to shut down a little bit. Okay, so 1.3.1, we're gonna have a look at one way to answer that particular question, and that is the use of direction, cosine, matrices, or DCM. Okay, or rotation matrices. So again, obviously, CBA would be used to describe the orientation of reference frame B with respect to reference frame A. Vectrix B dot product vectrix A transpose like that, okay? But to be more specific and tie things down to spacecraft applications, what we're gonna look at in terms of attitude representation of a spacecraft on orbit would be the rotation matrix that relates what's known as the body fix reference frame, B, with respect to our good old inertial reference frame, which happens to be the Earth-centered inertial reference frame, okay? So in other words, we're going to rewrite this generic rotation matrix in terms of specific uh, vectrices for spacecraft applications. And I'm going to write it this way, okay? Turns out that this particular rotation matrix, CBI, has a special name in spacecraft attitude dynamics and control applications, and that is the attitude matrix, okay? So whenever I'm gonna talk about 
calculating the attitude matrix or using the attitude matrix, always remember that that is just CBI as a rotation matrix. So that's kind of obvious. Uh, that's, that is the first choice that you can use to answer that particular question, or that is the first attitude representation uh, mathematical object that we can play with. The issue with CBI, if you want to choose that as the attitude representation of a spacecraft, is that you need to provide nine scalars, right? Because within CBI, you have nine entries, CBI being a three by three matrix. So nine entries to completely represent the current three-dimensional orientation of the body fixed reference frame, which is a spacecraft, with respect to the ECI reference frame. Just keep that in mind as we move forward, okay? Now, the second attitude determination or attitude representation, sorry, tool that we're going to use are the Euler angles in 1.3.2. So, Euler angles are just the three angles through which we're going to rotate our inertial reference frame to end up at the body fixed reference frame, okay? So that is through the sequence three, two, one. That is convenient because we had already analyzed this particular rotation sequence when I had said that that was the most popular rotation sequence for pretty much any aerospace applications, including aircraft, UAV, quad rotor, spacecraft, uh, things like that. So with the 3 2, 1 rotation sequence, previously we had denoted the individual rotation angles as being theta z, theta y, and theta x in a very generic manner. But what we're going to do now is to use specific angles with their specific names as they are employed in spacecraft applications, okay? So instead of talking about theta z, theta y, theta x, with a 3, 2, 1 rotation sequence, we're going to look at roll, pitch, and yaw angle. Where the yaw angle is going to be denoted by psi. The pitch angle is theta. And the roll angle is going to be phi. Okay? So this is yaw roll, pitch. So roll, pitch, yaw angles are common names for the angles associated with the 3, 2, 1 rotation sequence where a pitch angle is always the angle about an X unit vector. A roll angle is an angle of rotation about a Y unit vector and the yaw angle is always the one through which you rotate about Z unit vector and that's why for the 3, 2, 1 which corresponds to first rotation about Z, followed by rotation about Y, and last rotation about X, we are talking about the yaw, roll, pitch angles, respectively, okay? Um, and those three particular angles are the Euler angles, okay? So the roll, pitch, and yaw angles are your Euler angles. Now, one obvious benefit of using the role, the Euler angles to represent the current orientation of your body fixed reference frame with respect to the ECI reference frame, or in other words, to represent the current attitude of your sp spacecraft instantaneously with respect to some reference frame that doesn't move around. If you remember IX pointing at Aries in the vernal direction, equinox. Ix, I, Iz through the spin axis of the Earth, and Iy obtained by the cross product of Z with X. So that's our inertial reference frame. And the body fixed reference frame as its center at the center of mass of the spacecraft. And the individual unit vectors of the body fixed reference frame denoted by this are going to be aligned uh, as a function of the actual payloads or the instruments being carried on board the spacecraft or the actual mission. 
So we could have, for example, dx here, dy, and dz. So to describe fully the two-dimensional orientation of our spacecraft with respect to our inertial perspective, then only three angles would be sufficient. Because if you were to give me the roll pitch of the current orientation of your spacecraft, I would know exactly what would be, for example, the rotation matrix associated with that because I know how to bridge the gap between the sequence with their individual angle rotations to uh, a 92 matrix or a rotation matrix at the end of the day, okay? Uh, so again, one benefit of using Euler angles representation instead of the full blown out rotation matrix is just the number of information you have to provide. Here, three angles are sufficient because we know that this is for the three rotation, uh, this is for the C2 and that one is for the C1 principal rotation. So that's the main benefit, okay? Uh, now we have to be careful here because sometimes earlier angles are used to directly relate the body fixed reference frame to the inertial reference frame through the 3, 2, 1 rotation sequence. So in other words, going from the inertial reference frame, how you rotate to obtain the body fix, and that is the 3, 2, 1 sequence. But some other times, people use the 3, 2, 1 rotation sequence not to relate directly the body fix reference frame to the inertial reference frame, but rather to relate the body fix reference frame to the roll pitch uh, reference frame. Ah, a new reference frame. That is quite neat. Roll pitch uh, reference frame denoted by Q. Okay, so let's have a quick look at what is this new reference frame and how it is uh, organized in terms of the orientation of the respective unit vectors comprising the roll pitch uh, reference frame. Okay. So Let's first draw M1, the primary body attack, attracting the spacecraft, say a planet. This is an arc of an orbit. Let's say we have our spacecraft currently here in this particular orientation. And to understand the roll pitch our reference frame, which is Q, we need to go back to the notion of the orbital reference frame that we had seen in orbital mechanics, or the orbital reference frame had, had its origin at M1 and its OX unit vector always pointing at the spacecraft, its OZ unit vector being normal to the orbital plane in the direction of the specific orbital angular momentum vector that would be pointing right at you if you imagine the orbit being in the plane of the whiteboard. And then OY simply completing the triad through the cross product of OZ with OX. Okay? So as the spacecraft travels along its orbit, OX would rotate such that it always points at the spacecraft. Good. Okay. So that is the orbital reference frame that we have looked at in orbital mechanics. Now the new reference frame is referred to as the roll pitch yaw reference frame. And is obtained by a constant rotation matrix from the orbital reference frame. But the difference here is that the origin of the roll pitch yaw reference frame is at the center of mass of the spacecraft, SC the spacecraft. Okay? So the origin is shifted from M1 all the way to the spacecraft. And the relationship between the unit vectors of the orbital reference frame and roll pitch yaw is the following. So the x unit vector of roll pitch yaw is in the same direction as O y. 
so towards uh, or in the direction of the velocity vector or if you happen to be on a circular orbit exactly parallel to the velocity vector of the spacecraft but on a more generic elliptical orbit a y direction won't be equal to the velocity vector directly still in the same general uh, direction and so will be for qx qx in this direction okay qy the y unit vector of the roll pitch shell reference frame is obtained from oz but in the opposite direction so minus oz so here we had oz out of the board pointing right at you which means that qy is directly into the board and perpendicular to the board i'm going to try to draw it with a three-dimensional perspective like this but just keep in mind that this one goes into the board and lastly we have qz being just a cross product of x x cross product with y that will give you uh, qz but if you look at the relationship with respect to the orbital reference frame we're going to say that this is minus orbital x unit vector like that if x was pointing radially out we have qz pointing in this direction always pointing towards the gravitational uh, primary body m1 as a spacecraft travels around so at some time in the future we would have qx oriented like that qz pointing at m1 and the same thing as before with qy pointing into the board okay so that is the roll pitch uh, reference frame such that a roll angle would mean that the spacecraft, if I am the spacecraft and I happen to be traveling in this direction, I have my QX vector directly in that direction, in the same general direction as my velocity vector, essentially. So a roll angle is me rolling about this vector like that as I'm moving forward, okay? That is roll. Pitch would be the unit vector pointing say directly at you like that as I'm traveling in this direction so that is my QY unit vector such that the pitch angle is me rolling about this unit vector as I'm moving forward okay so roll motion pitch motion and the last motion is a yaw motion which would be through the unit vector coming from the spacecraft or me straight through the ground all right, so that the yaw motion will be me doing this. Okay, so hopefully you enjoyed that little dance of roll pitch up, and that kind of helped you figuring out the three different Euler angles and how they relate to roll pitch up. Okay, so all this to say that sometimes people use the 3 2 1 rotation sequence of roll pitch up angles directly express or represent the attitude between body fixed and ECI directly, but some other time people use the exact same sequence with also roll pitch shell angles, but this time to represent the attitude of the body fixed reference frame with respect to the blue reference frame, which is a roll pitch yaw reference frame. So if you as an engineer is interested at getting CBI, but you know that what is given to you is roll pitch uh, angles but for CBQ then all you have to do is to do the consecutive or successive rotation of rotation matrices and write that CBI which is the attitude matrix that you want at the end of the day will be related to CBQ through uh, roll pitch your angles using the 3 2 1 sequence times C Q O the constant rotation matrix 
by relating the attitude of roll pitch L with respect to orbital reference frame, or that is blue with respect to red. That's what CQO refers to. And finally, multiply this with COI, which is the relationship between the orbital reference frame and our good old inertial reference frame with IX pointing at a given star way out there, IZ along the spin axis of the Earth to the North Pole, and IY in the equatorial plane completing the cross product of X with Z. Okay? So this is the 3, 2, 1 sequence. This here, again, is a constant rotation matrix. So let's figure this out. That one is just a bunch of ones and zeros. By virtue of the fact that rho pitch is always oriented with respect to orbital reference frame in a constant way. So the attitude offset, if you will, between rho pitch and orbital is always the same, such that we're going to write that CQO, which is the one that relates uh, vectrix Q with respect to vectrix O. Or in other words, that relates the unit vectors of rho pitch Y to the unit vectors of orbital, so OX, OY, OZ. And just go back to the relationships we had here, and you say that QX is going to be equal to OY, so 0 times OX plus 1 times OY plus 0 times OZ. QY is minus OZ, so 0, OX, 0, OY, and minus 1, OZ. And finally, we have QZ equal to minus OX, so minus 1, 0, 0. Okay? So that is the constant rotation matrix CQO that you need to plug in here to determine the attitude matrix CBI, given the fact that in a particular situation, the Euler angles are used to denote uh, the orientation of the body fix, but with respect to roll pitch, uh, instead of directly relating body fix with respect to ECI. And the last rotation matrix, and this is COI, which we saw in orbital mechanics. So this is the one relating orbital to ECI through argument of latitude inclination in rayon, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'm gonna just say that where C O I is obtained by a three one three rotation sequence with angles uh, rayon, inclination, and argument of latitude, which you'll remember as being the summation of argument of perigee plus true anomaly. Okay? If you're not too sure about that one, go back to the lecture notes. Uh, that I'll probably post online next to the lecture notes of this course. I'm going to repost the orbital mechanics lecture notes just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So, okay. So with that, you have now all the pieces to calculate the attitude matrix. So all in all, Euler angles is a very neat and elegant way to represent the spacecraft attitude. And the main benefit compared to using the attitude matrix with nine entries is that all you need is those three individual angles, and you can take it from there and figure out uh, the attitude directly, okay? By virtue of the fact that the standard or the norm with earlier angles is to use the three, two, one rotation sequence. If that one happens to relate directly body space with respect to ECI, that's very good. Otherwise, you know how to go from 
body fixed roll pitch yaw from body fixed roll pitch yaw up to the attitude matrix where they body fixed with respect to ECI. Okay. So we looked at DCM, we looked at earlier angles. Now the third way to represent the attitude of a spacecraft in 1.3.3 is to use the axis angle representation. And this representation actually makes use of Euler's theorem. Okay, turns out that Euler was a pretty smart cookie because he came up with the three uh, law of motion that were used to derive the, uh, you know, that's the one that says that the cube of the semi-major axis is proportional to the square of the orbital period. That's the one that uh, stated the equal area and equal time, and the fact that all planets orbit along elliptical orbits around the sun, if you remember orbital mechanics. But he also came up with a theorem for attitude of rigid bodies that says that the orientation of any reference frame can be obtained from the orientation of another reference frame through one rotation only about a particular and very specific axis of rotation and through a rotation angle. So that's very good news because now we don't need to use three consecutive principal rotations back to back to go from say reference frame A to reference frame B because through Euler's theorem, we will have a way to go directly from A to B in terms of reference frames by one rotation. Now, obviously that rotation in the most generic case won't be one of the three unit vectors of reference frame A, but will be some random or some ang uh, or some uh, axis of rotation defined in 3D space. And by spinning about that single axis of rotation, we're going to get the full relationship between the two reference frames. Okay? So essentially, that means that we can represent the attitude of one reference frame with respect to another one by rotating or performing a rotation about one axis of rotation that we shall denote A through an angle about this axis denoted by phi. Okay? Well, don't, don't confuse this phi associate, associated with the axis angle representation and the roll angle. Those are two different things, okay? So how does that work? Well, essentially given this axis of rotation in terms of its components, in either reference frame A, the original reference frame, or the components of this axis of rotation in the final reference frame, which we've used so far generically as reference frame B, A and B. And given the rotation angle about this axis of rotation, that will map reference frame B to reference frame A. Now, I'm not sure if you had noticed uh, either in orbital mechanics or what we've done so far, but whenever you look at a rotation axis between two reference frames, the components of that rotation axis in either reference frames are going to be exactly the same because this is the axis of rotation, okay? So that, because of this fact, we're going to say that the components of this axis of rotation A vector seen in reference frame A is going to be exactly equal to the components of the same vector, which is the axis of rotation, seen in reference frame B. In B. And because of this, we're going to refer to the components of this vector in either reference frame to simply being just A uh, matrix, 3 by 1 column matrix, okay? So given this, and 
the rotation in terms of angle about this axis given in terms of components in either reference frame, we can then calculate CBA as being cos of the rotation angle times the identity matrix 3 by 3 plus one minus cos of that rotation angle times the components of the rotation axis a times itself transpose minus sine of the rotation angle times the rotation axis in terms of components in either a or b components will be exactly the same and then skew symmetric operator applied to this three by one column matrix to turn it into a three by three matrix okay so all this to say that now instead of using three earlier angles to completely determine or represent the attitude of the spacecraft with respect to the ECI reference frame you could also very well use an axis angle attitude representation but gee what would be the benefit here because with earlier angles all we needed were three scalars rho pitch yaw angles and that was it but now we went from three to one two three for x y z components of this axis of rotation and then four because we need to know the angle with which we rotate but in practice, all you need really here is three uh, pieces of information and not four because I'm going to say that the axis of rotation A is actually a unit vector, meaning that all you need then to completely describe or represent the attitude is two components of this vector instead of three and as well one angle which is your phi angle and why do we only need two components and not three for the x y z is because we're making use of the fact that this vector is a unit vector and therefore its Euclidean norm denoted by this, which is the square root of its x component square plus y component square plus z component square will always be equal to 1. And therefore, with only 2 out of these three components, you can then figure out yourself the third one. Or in other words, the third components missing from this guy is deterministic meaning that it can be exactly calculated as opposed to being stochastic which would mean that it could have been whatever and the reason for that is because of the unity uh, constraint which is applied to the rotation axis or this vector a okay so again to sum up you only need three pieces of information one for the rotation angle and only two out of three components for this vector because the third one can be easily determined by applying this constraint and therefore can be solved out of that equation okay so this is how you could go from axis angle representation to determining the rotation matrix or if you want to apply it to the spacecraft specific situation, get your C, B, I, or your attitude matrix out of that. That is a very powerful theorem that was discovered by Euler. But you can also play with the equations and do the opposite. So given a rotation matrix, 
how can you figure out what will be the axis of rotation and the angle of rotation. So the inverse problem will be to solve for the axis of rotation given the attitude matrix. And the answer is just taking one half of C X X plus C Y Y plus C Z Z. So given the nine numerical values of an attitude matrix or any rotation matrix, we take the first row, first column, second row, second column, and third row, third column entries, sum them all up, and do one half. Our cost of that is going to give you the angle of rotation needed to go from one reference frame to the other one, and all this, sorry, is minus one in the end. Okay? And now that you have, say, determined the rotation angle, you can also then calculate the components of your rotation axis. Okay. A is the same as this, which would be the same as CYZ minus CZY. This divided by two times psi of the axis of rotation, which you had solved for previously here. Now the y component of this, uh, of the rotation axis seen in either reference frame A or B, it's going to be the same, it's going to be equal to CZX minus CXZ divided by 2 sine phi and lastly c x y minus c y x divided by 2 sine of your rotation angle and this is how you can relate the axis angle representation which only requires three pieces of information and not four if you do that mistake and turn that into a rotation matrix or the other way around use your rotation matrix or your attitude matrix and turn that into the axis angle representation through those formulas one thing to note is that those equations are only valid for phi different than plus minus pi plus minus 3 pi plus minus 5 pi and so on and so on because otherwise uh, that denominator won't work anymore so if you have a case where when you calculate that you end up at pi 3 pi plus or minus 5 pi and so on and so on then you need to use our alternate equations to get the components of your axis of rotation or to get your ax a y a z and those formulas are plus minus square root of one plus c one one or c x x i prefer to use the letters from the subscript of a rotation matrix instead of the index in terms of number of rows and columns so one plus c x x over two like that plus minus square root of 1 plus c y y over 2 and lastly plus minus square root of 1 plus c z z over 2 that is for the x y z components of your rotation axis a in terms of its components okay uh, so the plus minus here only corresponds to if you happen to have plus pi then use the plus if you end up at minus pi for the angle you would use the minus signs here and same for 3 pi 5 pi plus minus 7 pi okay and so on and so on good 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 good
So that was the third way to represent the attitude of a rigid body or a given reference frame or a spacecraft with respect to some other reference frames. And again, in case of a spacecraft, that reference will be our ECI reference frame, okay? So let's move to the fourth way to answer the question, what is the current orientation of my spacecraft? Because we can answer that by giving a full rotation matrix, or we can answer that question by only specifying three Euler angles, or PGR. Or we could specify or answer that question by providing two components of the axis of rotation and the rotation angle related to Euler's theorem. Or alternatively, which is the most preferred way to do things in spacecraft attitude dynamics and control in academia and research centers, government, industry, all over the place, is through the use of quaternions. Okay? So quaternions is an alternate way to describe the orientation of a reference frame to another one, which has been around for quite a long time, and it's used also in the video game industry quite a bit for 3D graphic rendering and things like that. Uh, turns out that it's also very useful for spacecraft applications. And that one is actually related to the Euler's theorem or the axis angle representation. Okay? And that particular attitude representation has several benefits. The first one is that it doesn't have any singularities. Because if you look at Euler's angle, rho pitch yaw, there are instances where given two out of the three angles, the third one could not be calculated to give a single solution. Or in other words, the third Euler angle cannot be uniquely determined given the first two. Okay? Whereas with Caternus, we do not have any singularities or specific orientations that would put us into trouble to turn the representation, say, into a rotation matrix or vice versa. And as a matter of fact, there was a question in orbital mechanics, I believe in chapter one, which was about finding the singularity of the 313 rotation sequence to relate the orbital reference frame to the inertial reference frame or vice versa. And so you had gone through the process of finding the singularity in terms of uh, consecutive rotation using the principal rotation. Well, it turns out that earlier angles lead to singularities, but not quaternions. And another advantage of using quaternions is that, as we'll see later on, the kinematics differential equations that will allow us to calculate the rate of change of a rotation matrix or the rate of change of earlier angles or the rate of change of quaternions well it turns out that the rate of change in quaternions with time or if their kinematics differential equations won't involve any trig functions which is a great benefit whenever you talk about implementing those equations on board a spacecraft on the onboard computer so whenever you can avoid trig functions, you're going to have some great benefit in terms of computational power to execute those lines of codes onto the spacecraft itself, okay? So because of this, quaternions are pretty much the norm in spacecraft attitude, representation, and control. So the way they are denoted is that a quaternion is denoted by Q matrix. And actually, it is a four by one column matrix. It contains four entries because this is again related to Euler's theorem or the axis angle representation that had 
four parameters. Well, it turns out the quaternions also have four parameters. The first three entries are AX, AY, AZ, which again are the X, Y, Z components of the axis of rotation that we used in Euler's theorem for the previous representation times sine of half of the angle of rotation. And here the same sine of half of the angle of rotation about that particular axis of rotation. The same for the third component. And the last component or the fourth component of your quaternion is going to be simply cos of the half axis of rotation like that. Now because the first three entries of that 4x1 column matrix are related to not only the angle of rotation but also the axis of rotation, the first three elements are widely referred to as the vector part of the quaternion because AX, AY, AZ are the X, Y, Z components of the uh, vector that represents the rotation axis, which is your A vector. And the last entry of the quaternion, because it's only function of phi, the angle is simply known as the scalar part of your quaternion, okay? Turns out that this could be written a little bit more concisely as follows. So again, four by one, within which the first three entries are collected together under epsilon, which will be a three by one. And the last entry, the scalar part, will be denoted by eta, just like that. Where obviously, we can say that epsilon matrix looks like the uh, euro symbol, actually. But I'm not talking about finances here, I'm talking about attitude dynamics, so don't get confused. Okay, so the uh, vector part of my quaternion is simply equal by definition to the first three entries. sine half angle, sine half angle, and sine half angle here, and also where eta had been set to be equal by definition to simply cos of half of the angle, okay? Now, if you remember our discussion about the axis angle added to the presentation, or in other words, Euler's theorem, I said that the fourth uh, piece of information was not required because it was deterministic. And why it was deterministic is because it could be calculated by using the unity constraint on the axis of rotation. Turns out that it is exactly the same for the quaternion added to the presentation. Okay, so this is a four parameter representation for which only three components are required because the fourth one is deterministic and thereby can be calculated using a constraint. That constraint on the quaternion is referred to as the unity constraint or unity quaternion constraint, which says that the Euclidean norm of this four by one column matrix has to be equal to one. Or in other words, that epsilon x square plus epsilon y square plus epsilon z square plus eta square, square root of all that, has to be equal to 1. Okay? That is a unity constraint on the quaternion that needs to be satisfied at any point in time. 
Okay. Now, another cool thing you can do with quaternion is to turn them into attitude matrix, if that's what you want to do, but may not be necessary, but it's just good to know that a quaternion could be related to a rotation matrix relating reference frame B to reference frame A, or more specifically in spacecraft applications relating the body fixed frame to the inertial reference frame, given the quaternion. So the answer to that is to take the scalar part square minus the vector part as a three by one transpose times a three by one vector part. Multiply all this by the identity matrix three by three plus two times the vector part times vector part transpose minus two times the scalar part eta times vector part skew symmetric. And obviously the skew symmetric of a three by one ends up being the three by three skew symmetric matrix that you construct out of the initial column matrix. Uh, and that is the three by three that has the zeros on the lead diagonal, the minus Z on the X, Y entry, the positive X. I don't know on top of my head. You have to go back to the lecture notes to figure out exactly how to construct a skew symmetric matrix out of a three by one. But if I'm not mistaken, that would be zeros here, minus z, maybe x or y, I forgot, this is positive z. Anyway, okay, so go back to orbital mechanics or somewhere in the lecture notes here and figure out this two-symmetric construction out of the three by one, okay? Uh, so that's one way that you can convert from one representation to another one, in that case from quaternions to attitude matrix. But you can also do the exact opposite, which would be to go from attitude matrix to quaternions. And if that's what you want to do, the first thing you'll do is calculate the scalar part of the quaternion, eta, which is going to be equal to plus minus one half of what's known as the trace of your attitude matrix CBA or most specifically CBI, doesn't even matter. Trace of your matrix three by three plus one and square root of this, where the trace mathematical operator refers to the summation of the elements along the lead diagonal of your matrix if you have a three by three matrix, you take this entry plus that one plus this one, and that is the trace of the matrix. Gives you a scalar plus one, square root of, and half will give you a scalar, the scalar part of the quaternion. And where the, let me write it down here, the vector part of the quaternion given a rotation matrix is going to be equal to one over four over eta, the scalar part times C Y Z minus C Z Y C Z X minus C X Z and finally C X Y minus C Y X where those denote the entries within the rotation matrix according to their location first row first column and whatever Okay, just look at the subscripts and you'll be able to figure this out on your own. Good. So that is how to go from quaternions to attitude matrix or vice versa, how to calculate the quaternions given the attitude matrix CBI, specifically in the case of spacecraft attitude dynamics or generically speaking, CBA. Okay. Uh, the last thing you can do with quaternions is similar to what we did with rotation matrices, and that is to do consecutive, consecutive uh, rotations. Remember, with rotation matrices, we had, for example, CCA equal to CCB times CBA. 
So we're just stacking them together like that, one after the other, making sure that the subscripts were making sense. Well, we can do a very similar thing with quaternions. And I'll show you how. So successive rotations with quaternions. All right. So this is analogous to successive rotations with rotation matrices, where CCA was obtained as CCB followed by CBA like that. Now the equivalent in terms of quaternion, if you take the quaternion that denotes the orientation of reference frame C with respect to A, it's not just going to be quaternions CB times quaternions BA, because that won't work in terms of linear algebra, right? Because this is a 4 by 1. 4 by 1 and 4 by 1. So how can you multiply a 4 by 1 with a 4 by 1? It just doesn't work out this way. So instead, what we're doing is that we're taking this, four, this first quaternion and turning it into a 4 by 4 matrix. We, and from there, we could then multiply our 4 by 4 with this 4 by 1 to end up indeed on this side with a 4 by 1 quaternion, okay? So that is the trick. Now the question is, how can you uh, turn a quaternion into a 4 by 4 matrix? So I'm going to use Q like tilde is equal to, so any Q that you want to turn into a 4 by 4, you're going to take eta its scalar part times the identity 3 by 3 minus the vector part 3 by 1 it's going to turn into a two symmetric matrix and plug that 3 by 3 in that corner of this matrix now here you're going to have a 3 by 1 which is going to be the vector part of your quaternion directly and then here you take your vector part 3 by 1 turn it into a 1 by a 1 by 3 and then the last entry has to be a 1 by 1 to ensure that the whole thing is 4 by 4 and that is just by using the scalar part of your quaternion okay and once you've constructed your 4 by 4 then you just multiply it with the regular quaternion in that case denoting or representing the orientation of B with respect to A Good, that was a lot of fun, right? Learning new stuff is always fun compared to the previous lecture was more or less a review of what you should have known already. Uh, so today, again, to kind of summarize what we did in this lecture is that we looked at four ways to represent the attitude of a spacecraft on orbit, or in other words, to, in, to answer the question, what is the actual or the current orientation of my body fixed reference frame with respect to my inertial reference frame? The first answer to that question, or one way to answer it, was through the use of a direction cosine matrix, or through the use of our attitude matrix, our CBI, rotation matrix. Second way is just by specifying three earlier angles, rho, pitch, ya, that are inherently associated with the 3, 2, 1 rotation sequence, either taking us directly from ECI to body fix, or describing the orientation of body fix with respect to an intermediate reference frame which happened to be the roll pitch our reference frame and we did the math to go from cbq to cbi through two additional rotation matrices the coi and the cqo rotation matrices we looked at that the third way to answer the question related to attitude representation was through the use of Euler's theorem or the use of axis angle representation so just by selecting carefully one axis of rotation in 3d space how could we go from one reference frame to the other one just by spinning around that particular axis to an angle phi and then lastly we looked at the concept of quaternions which again is paramount to any spacecraft attitude dynamics guidance navigation and control so make sure you watch this video a couple of times, especially the part where I talked about quaternions, 
to make sure that you are able to wrap your head around this concept and set a solid foundation upon which we are going to build in the subsequent lectures. Thank you guys. Uh, that one was a fun to record. So I hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.